and welcome to Let's Talk Assassin's Creed, your number one show for all things Assassin's Creed. Yeah, good evening everyone and welcome to episode 105. In this week's episode, we're going to talk about Valhalla, fact and fiction. Um, we're going to talk about the historical setting, the historical background. We're going to use that phrase that you hear a lot when people are discussing Assassin's Creed, historical accuracy. I'm going to be honest, it's not a phrase that I'm all that keen on. I, feel, I think historically inspired maybe is a, a better phrase. And I think it all goes all the way back to Assassin's Creed 1 and that crossbow, which uh, some people even now say was removed for historical accuracy. It wasn't. Um, but we need some help to talk about Valhalla. This is a, a period of history that is not so well documented, documented. There aren't so many written resources. Of course, there's lots of archaeology. Um, so we need the help of a professional. And uh, this week we have uh, joining us Mr. Donlan, a history teacher. Welcome to the show. Hey, uh, thanks for having me, everybody. Um, I teach uh, world history high school level uh, here in uh, Boston. I know it's a it's a lovely place. It's got some Assassin's Creed history in it, too. And uh, I started um, really playing the games, getting into the history behind the games when I had many of my students very interested in whether or not the history was uh, fact or fiction. So um, there is no, uh, there is no bad question here. I think all of these, uh, games have a lot to offer in terms of both history and inspiring people to be into history. So whether it's a crossbow or not, it leads to a good discussion and that's what, hopefully what I'm here for. <laughs> Fantastic. So, uh, what should we say, Declan? Eyes forward, pay attention in class. Um, <laughs> I'd say, so at the, what you said there about the children coming to you in, in class, what was the first game that they came to you and said, uh, so we've been playing whatever, and we want to know if this really happened in Rome or that really happened in Constantinople. Where did it start for in terms of um, pupils or students' questions? Um, that's interesting. I actually think it might have started from me. Um, you know, I was reflecting on this a bit earlier, thinking where, where was the first time I referenced Assassin's Creed in class? or a student reference Assassin's Creed in class. And I think it actually was, um, was because of something that I did. I had them working on a, a project once. This was back when Assassin's Creed Syndicate was really popular. And um, I, you know, I, I hadn't played the game at the time. I knew the game was about Victorian London. I knew that there was a heavy emphasis on um, you know, sort of the uh, different uh, gangs that were you know, very popular in London at the time. And I thought it would be kind of engaging, again, a very teacher word to, you know, maybe there is a student out there that would find this interesting or fascinating, or maybe they would, uh, you know, wake up if they saw something referenced from Assassin's Creed. So I had them working on a map. There was a map um, of London at the time, or, you know, it was a portion of London. And they had different primary sources where they had to kind of find where the certain gangs were located which was quite the task. It ended up being really difficult for a lot of the kids to find the different streets or like the different, you know, sections of, of the city and figure out, you know, essentially, you know, where their borders were or what kind of territories they had. It was cool in theory. It didn't work. It was, it was kind of a flop. I ended up not using it again. But the map, the background, I thought it'd be fun if I included the map from Assassin's Creed. I found it online. And I put it in and so the kids were kind of finding the different locations. And, and that was by far the spark because while the lesson didn't go as planned, the, the kids had a tough time using the sources and finding where they were on the map. The, you know, the lesson didn't work. The interest was really there. There were a number of students that were, you know, very into the discussion about, you know, the different um, lifestyle of the gangs. They were very into uh, their interpretation in the game. You know, hey, Mr. Donlin, is, is this is this what they would do? Would they walk around like this? Or, you know, hey, Mr. Don, is this, is this weapon something they would use? And um, it, it definitely, I started to pick up on pretty quickly just how, you know, much it was, you know, teaching through these visuals or bringing up something that they were familiar with that uh, really led to something, you know, that led to a good discussion, I'll say. Um, I ended up mostly saying, no, not quite, or uh, I'm not sure if that's all that accurate. Um, but there were one or two instances where I saw something that was almost, dare I say, overwhelmingly accurate, like detail oriented to the point where they have access to some serious sources on their hands that I said, whoa, 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 there's something going on here. There's, there, there, there's definitely more to these games. And, uh, and then slowly but surely, I started weaving in 
a few more aspects of Assassin's Creed um, in Unity. I, uh, I I really liked the detective uh, element to uh, to the games. There was you know a couple of uh, obviously they're optional, but you can go around Paris and find uh, clues to different um, yes. to different things and sort of yes. discover a mystery. You guys are familiar with the mystery, the Paris mysteries. <laughs> well, I tell you, um, just on that point, you've already from your syndicate intro, I've written down a couple of points I'd love to come back to. But just on the point sure. of the Unity detective stories, mm-hmm. um, I'm currently re-listening to uh, Mike Duncan's Revolutions series and specifically the series on the French Revolution. Okay. Um, because I've just finished the Unity, uh, the, the game Unity, and I'm just kind of a bit obsessed now with the French Revolution. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the murder mysteries that we do in Unity is the murder of Marat. And he died in the bath because he had a skin condition that required him to sit in cool water to soothe his skin. Yep. Um, and the murderer was a, a lady called Charlotte Corday, who came into the city from, I think, Normandy picked up an ordinary sort of kitchen knife and decided that this guy needed to die. I did it in the game thinking it was just a murder. I'd, I'd heard the name Marat, but I didn't realize he was an important or it was a real murder. And now, uh, just yesterday, when I was uh, listening to that particular episode of, of Mike Duncan's podcast, it's a real mm-hmm. murder that really happened. And she Amazing. was a real <laughs> criminal. And I just think, and it's only a small thing. It's a, it's a 10 minute quest. But I just think, this is amazing that this actually yeah. is in the game. And we as Arno we helped solve that murder. I mean, in real life, she just stood there and she was quickly apprehended. She didn't try to defend herself. But even so, the fact that that murder mystery is in the game, I think it's just wonderful. Yeah, it, it, it blows my mind. <laughs> in, a weird, in a weird way, it is, uh, you know, for, for me as a teacher, it's, it's so hard sometimes to, uh, to you know, make my classroom come alive or get kids really into history. You know, there's so many things you're battling. You're battling TikTok, you're you know, you're battling whatever's uh, popular in their daily life. And uh, yeah. every once in a while, you, you sit there and you scratch your head and you go, oh, it's really hard to tell a really good story nowadays with, you know, just how, you know, it's just how much technology has advanced. It's just, it's a, it's a different time. And then you have something like that, that is playable. It's, it's interactive. You sort of discover it as you go. So I actually had them play a, a very specific version of the, uh, of the mysteries. They had to uh, kind of go into different groups and, um, and kind of like, you know, read some sources and try to discover it on their own. They had to play the role of the detectives. Um, and it wasn't in the game, but it was heavily inspired by the game. And at the end of it, uh, when a couple of students asked me, they said, oh, you know, this was really interesting. Were these stories made up? And I was uh, taken back and said, I think a lot of people have that kind of reaction when they um, see these stories in the game. They think, oh, this must be just the creative writers or this just must be their... Uh, you know, the, the level designers were trying to come up with a reason for you to go inside this house or, or whatever. So, you know, they spitballed and something landed on the dartboard and they said, OK, we'll just come up with this name, this person, and just sort of have fun with it. Um, similar to my students saying, where did this come from? Um, and I was able to safely say, oh, no, no, this was all directly inspired by, you know, what would be a real detective case back then. And, uh, you know, as immersed you are in the case, you're also learning about uh, how difficult it would be at the time to solve a case like this. You're learning about, you're using clues that would be relevant to the time period. So in, in a sense, it's almost like they're not just immersing themselves in ideas of the game, but they're immersing themselves in real history in that sense as well. I mean, you know, the details have been changed a little for gameplay purposes, but at the same time, if they're immersed in their history, then that's that's a pretty big win at the end of the day. <laughs> Absolutely. I wish my history classes had been like that. That's all I can say. <laughs> Sam, I think... Uh, how well I was playing Assassin's Creed, I think I would have been the one kid in the class always jumping up like, I'll play this game. Yeah. How accurate <laughs> is it? You know, is this true? Because I, I know it's a bit off topic, I did spend hours upon hours playing Assassin's Creed and then sitting in the history section in the library, seeing if any of it's true. You know, where yeah. the threads came from and if there's any truth to them. Yeah. How did it change for you? Sorry, sorry, Mr. Dunn. No, sorry, go ahead. You're fine. How did it change for you then when, now you haven't played Origins, so maybe this question won't apply. If we skip forward another year to Odyssey's release, Ubisoft created and released a dedicated discovery tour. Have you used the discovery tours from the three latest games for for in-class teaching? What what impact have they had? Well, so um, the, the, the difficulty with using the, the discovery tours in class is um, it's, 
it's hard because it's one player. Um, it's uh, the kind of thing where I wish I could sort of hook it up to my projector and just sort of let a couple of students play it. But the way that, you know, a classroom is structured is makes that in a way difficult. I think we're almost on like, I think the very next uh, discovery tour might be the, you know, the, the one that finally bridges the gap 100%. I know they really build these towards teachers. Um, and, and I think there's so much it offers. It, it, an overwhelming amount of it is so usable in the classroom. I think playability wise, it's, it's tough. I think you kind of have to temper some expectations. You know, when you have a, a class of 30 students come in and, um, and half of them have never even played a video game before, let alone are familiar with, uh, Assassin's Creed, they, as the years go by, they're better at using a controller, but, um, not all of them are as fluent. Um, so it's, it's one of those things where I think I've used the, the inspiration of, uh, of, of, you know, the, uh, of the databases first, I guess I'll say, and uh, of the discovery tour. Um, it's hard to get students to play it, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Um, but for the students that do have the game and for the students that can sort of, uh, you know, stomach many different videos that kind of go through the experience itself, I think there's just enough there for teachers to be able to say, you should, if, if you find any of this interesting at all, or, you know, as a substitute to like a certain assignment, do you have Assassin's Creed Val? Because this is it. This is definitely a way to, uh, you know, to, um, to learn about this culture, to learn about, um, to learn about the Vikings. I've actually just recently, just this past weekend, finished the, uh, the, the latest one, obviously the uh, discovery tour in the Viking age. Um, and, uh, again, I'm still thinking at the moment, how can I weave this into my class? How could I get a couple students playing it or how could I play it and have students kind of record things that they notice or make some observations or, you know, how can I use some of the sources that are in there? They have some great photos. There's some just excellent stuff that's from different museums. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, how could I, you know, how could I do this? Um, one theory I had to, uh, to bringing it in, and this was, this goes all the way back to, um, Assassin's Creed uh, Odyssey, actually, I had an idea that I was going to try to have a couple different um, projectors going at once and have kids break up into four different groups and have them explore different parts of Greece and then come back and kind of tell me about the different areas that they explored. But it's, it's hard to get um, space to do that. It's hard to get like different locations to do that. And it's hard to get the, uh, the kids, you know, they, they don't necessarily want to bring in their Xbox. They're nervous. Like they go, Hey, Don, if I stick this in my locker and someone takes it, it's on you, man. <laughs> That's so a good it, point, isn't uh, it? You, you can't just run this game or these discovery tools on an iPad. You need a decent console and or yeah, a decent PC. Yeah. And these things are expensive for schools. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you're not going to have 30 Xboxes or Playstations or, or gaming PCs lined mm -hmm. up in, in the classroom. Well, so that's an interesting point. Yeah. So I think re realistic wise, I've, I've wanted, it's, it's like, it's, a, it's a big urge. It's always been something that's been kind of itching away at me when I get to the topic to say, ah, oh, you know, if only they could see it, if only they'd explore it, they would understand it. They'd be able to take away with, you know, what this culture looked like, what this culture, uh, you know, felt like, what it'd be like to walk these streets is something that I've always said, okay, this is the time we're going to do it. But if I can flip the question a bit, I think this is something that I've always thought of in, in recent years. Um, as far as our practice as teachers, I think it would be very constructive to have multiple world history teachers like myself uh, meet together and, and play this game and discuss it and say, how can we get the elements that are in this game into our classroom? How can Definitely. we engage our students the way this game engages with history? You know, how can we make it fun to walk through this city? To How can we make it fun to, to learn about here, to collect these tokens? And I think you know, if I was sitting in a room with five or six of the teachers and we were playing the game, we would come up with some really cool lessons just from that alone. So, you know, maybe you'd, you'd find a week later, a, a kid would come home and say, hey, mom, dad, we, we played a, a lesson inspired by Assassin's Creed. We didn't get to play the game, but now I really want to play the game, you know, or something like that. So I'm always <laughs> trying to think, I think uh, other teachers yeah, really yeah. should look at what Ubisoft is doing. I mean, it's, uh, it is, it, I, I know I said mind blowing already with the, uh, the Paris mysteries, but they are exceeding a lot of my expectations at every turn with um, the way they use history, the way they teach history, and you know the way they're open to describing how the game is created using history as well. I think that was one feature of the newest um, Discovery Tour that surprised me the most was just how ready they were to unveil 
their character designs, their city designs in a way that I think the other um, tours were, were much more fact. And uh, here's some, you know, kind of, you know, nuggets of information or, you know, here is, you know, a really cool, um, you know, story from history that we use. But the, the newest one um, brought in the, the designers. It brought in, you know, some of their theories about what these places looked like and some of the, the ongoing sort of debate in a way of, you know, hey, we, we have a couple of different historians that say this, we have some game designers who say this and they come together and they essentially um, envision it in a lot of different ways. And I think that was really interesting the way they did that. It might, to me, inspire some students to sort of look at um, how they view history and say, okay, well, what, what would my interpretation of this be? Or how would I design this? And I think that's really neat the way they inspire that with the newest one. Just on that point, as you made with all the different sources, it's clear to see with Valhalla that even though history can't be accurate, as stated in, I believe, Assassin's Creed 1, it's the winner that rewrites history. Mm -hmm. There is a lot of depth and historical clashes in the game that kind of seem what the world would look like. For example, we have London, which is a perfect clash of Viking Age and a decayed old Roman town and living in England now there is some places around Cumbria where I live where you can see the remnants of Roman towns still standing mm -hmm. in the 20th century so they had that really great great clash of one world that's gone with the Romans and a world that's starting new with the Vikings and how I believe I thought it was a mystery but it was just statues there was um angel statues all over England yeah, which represented oh yeah. uh, which I thought was some easter egg or some mission but mm -hmm. someone told me that they were highly linked to a Roman deity or a Roman belief and having them around the world just kind of give you that sense of this is an England that's populated by the pagans as they called themselves as the Romans called them and mm -hmm. it's not just a place where everyone's fighting for attention it's a world that's just full of history it's been clashing you know the romans settled here they did a lot for britain and now the vikings are doing the same so it was great to see that there was a lot of fighting between roman and vikings and it must have been difficult to get the balance because of how some history would write it and some architects may say well no that didn't happen mm -hmm. but i think they must have found a really great balance because i believe that a a lot from what I felt in the game did come off more how history would have looked like in that time. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. I think um, if you play a game like, I'm trying to think of one that sort of plays fast and loose with some historical events, I would say probably Assassin's Creed 3 um, definitely goes with some interesting interpretations of the American Revolution. Um, and sort of kind of changes up the formula a bit with the way that like the Templars influence history different than how history really changed. Um, but even that is, there's small examples there that kind of tie themselves back to, uh, to the real history um, in, in, you know, some, some different ways. And I think what the team at Ubisoft is really good at, at doing is they, they fill in a lot of gaps really nicely sometimes um, where if there's like, you know, mystery between, and between two events or there's some mystery, there's some gray area between um, a, a historical figure and, you know, a, a friend that they may or may not have had or a connection that they may or may not have had. You know, there's some element of mystery they're able to, you know, kind of um, plug in parts of their storyline. I think most recently the games have been really doing a cool job at this with the, um, you know, the idea that the gods played a key role with the Isu. You know, they have their own version of their uh, timeline that they're trying to tell. And I think in a way, that kind of gets back to what you were saying about how you know different civilizations clashed and in a way it's it's relevant towards how different um civilizations had different beliefs and different uh gods and goddesses and deities but even those different beliefs are, are similar um there's you know almost like a collective unconscious if you want to quote from carl Jung, that you know kind of blends a lot of these different cultures and their values together it, you know a lot of their gods are very similar from the from the Zeus's to the Odin's, you know, they have similar qualities, similar capabilities. And I think what Assassin's Creed is trying to do is they're saying, yeah, that's part of our narrative, that they're similar. It's part of our, our overarching story that 
they are in a way connected. You know, the, the Romans are connected to the Vikings. And I got to be honest, that's one of the biggest themes in my classroom is that history is connected. History is relevant. You know, you're playing a game about the Viking Age, but it's not just about the Vikings. It's about the Anglo-Saxons. It's about uh, Francia and you know, how that impacted um, the whole of Europe. And so I think they, they really nail that really well in the, in the latest game. I, I think more so than they do some of the other games where they really stick to just one location or one group of people. In Valhalla, it's, it's a mix there. There are so many different groups going on. I mean, you know, heck, you even go to, uh, to North America in some parts of the game and they nail the accents there too. So, you know, it's great to see just how uh, connected they are. Um, you know, you hear a lot from, uh, from people online talking about like the diversity among the new Assassin's Creed games. But I think what people have to realize is, yes, that world was very diverse. Um, I did a podcast a, a few weeks ago talking about how Dublin was the most populous, most successful trading port in Europe during the rise of the Vikings. And, you know, that doesn't come without there being a lot of different uh, populations uh, across Europe, even all the way from Africa making their way into, uh, into Europe. So very interesting the way that they've sort of embraced this cultural history and sort of said, oh, different character models, let's do it. Oh, a new location? Sounds good. <laughs> I just wanted to quickly briefly touch, because I've been burning to discuss this for weeks. <laughs> okay. Um, when they visited Vinland, there was a bit of like, you know, is this historically accurate? Did Vikings actually go to Vinland that early? But it has been confirmed due to analysis of wood from timber frame buildings in Newfoundland that Norses could have actually built settlements there. 471 years before Columbus. <laughs> yep. So it kind of shows that maybe Valhalla was 100% historically right with Vinland, that Vikings may have been there before anyone else. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the the impact that they make is, like the impact that they make on Vinland, I think is the more, um, I would say, divisive historical uh, interpretation. I'd say you, you talk to some Viking historians that would say, oh no, they, they were here, they established themselves, uh, they were here for a while, and they made some, some, some serious connections. And then you'll talk to other historians that'll talk about how they, in a way, they just wanted to sort of plant a flag and then go home. Um, and I, I tend to lean more towards uh, Vinland as a temporary settlement just based on some of what I've read from this background and obviously reading through some of the sagas, it, it seems as though they were very aware of the uh, cultural history of some Native American groups, which they could not have been if they were only there for a short period of time. So it, again, I think it's great that Assassin's Creed is able to sort of tap into this and sort of say that, you know, talking about Viking history is really complicated. It's not as simple as they just sailed to this spot and raided it and went home. You know, there was a lot of things happening. There's uh there's a long, you know, history here that's very complicated regarding their relations with different groups. And I think in Vinland, it's one where um, you're going to have a hard time if you're looking for like hard evidence of certain things happening. Um, but when you really talk about dates and uh, the proximity between uh, Vinland and, you know, obviously uh, Iceland and Greenland, where, where many of the sagas were written, uh, that's when you start to notice that they were they were very aware of this uh, kind of growing trade network around this uh, around this region, and it's it's hard not to deny that the Vikings did to uh, to some in, to some degree have an impact on uh, on Vinland in North America. So, I get pumped when that discussion comes up, though, because I think a lot of people get really passionate into oh they were there for like ten minutes and they went home, um, which I think is again part of a a larger misunderstanding of the, how the Vikings um, were seen around the world. You know, you, you tend to find that the kind of person says, yeah, the Vikings showed up and then they left. It's uh, they, they would use the same argument for the Vikings everywhere else. So they say the same for the Vikings in Constantinople when there's a lot of sources that you know, beg to differ. Um, it's just that we're fighting against a, a stereotype that the Vikings were the, the raiders were, you know, clashed with cultures and only fought against cultures. Where in reality, like I said, it's much more complicated than that. There's a very complex history built around uh, trade and relations and things like that. And I think Vinland is kind of a key that undoes a lock there. Then the, hopefully the door that it opens is, wow, there's so much more to this history. They really stayed and hung out and uh, we got to discover it more. There's just more out there. Certainly in the game, they uh, they avoided or they dodged any questions about dates and exact precision by simply saying that the order of ancients were always 
one step ahead of um, you know other organized groups at the time. So that if the if the if the the Norse were starting to head west in that direction, then the Order of Ancients were going to make sure they were being a little bit faster than everyone else and getting there first to try and find this uh, this ancient vault and this mm-hmm. uh, these ancient devices. Absolutely. I wanted to ask a question then. Um, I want to go right to the core of this story. Um, when we first launch Valhalla, we're given the choice of playing as a male character or a female character or sort of a, a character that, that switches the gender depending on where you are in the story and what realm you are in. Um, this has been a decision that, that annoys some players very much. And for most players, I think they're, they're just happy to sort of choose the animus option and go ahead and play. Um, what's the what's known or what's been discovered through archaeology about men fighting and women fighting um, and exploring and raiding um, during this time? Good question. <laughs> um, I, I, again, I'm very aware of, uh, of the discussions. I'm definitely uh, the kind of person that... Um, Whereas when the game was starting to come out, I think I was very engaged. You know, I'd, I'd jump into a ch- like a, a chat room or a comment section or two and sort of express my knowledge as much as I could. And then as the game sort of dwindled on, I, I think part of me said, okay, well, wait, wait until they play as a female Eivor. Wait until they, they see the different situations as they, are, as they arise. And I think, you know, maybe it'll start to make more sense. Um, because I, as far as accuracy goes, uh, there are plenty of accounts that uh, will tell um, stories of heroism, of shield maidens. There's plenty of accounts that will uh, talk about uh, female Viking warriors um, going above and beyond for their families and different things. And I think at the core of Valhalla's story, this is kind of what it's about. It's not necessarily about uh, kingship, because obviously that would put a... Um, put a serious uh, problem in the historical accuracy. It, it's mostly about family. And I think what it's trying to say is that uh, a female Viking had a very significant uh, impact um, in the role of a Viking family and the role of a Viking clan. Now, um, was that impact the same as the role that a man would play? Uh, usually no, um, in terms of the different you know, Viking sagas and things like that as well. Um, but at the same time, that there, there's still obviously plenty of exceptions uh, to that rule. So it's, it's complicated. I, I would say that I think what, what's interesting about what, uh, what Ubisoft has done, I think they have really tried to create a setting that would be very relevant for both characters, male or female. Um, and I wonder if that has been something that opened some doors for them creative wise or closed some if they were trying to focus on just a male character or just a female character. Um, I find it interesting to get into uh, discussions about what kind of roles female would females would have because it's, it's fascinating when you uh, talk to people about um, how in the sagas, it's mostly uh, females, it's mostly wives that encourage men to, uh, to go into battle. It's mostly the uh, the wife that will say, you need to pick up that sword and you need to go end this feud. Oh, and really? So, that's really enough, interesting. That's, yeah, that's kind of, the, to me at least, when I see Eivor in certain you know scenes or in certain situations with characters, um, I see him as very similar. <laughs> I see him as the kind of character that really fits this bill of somebody that is trying to uh, explain why someone should fight. And in many of the Viking sagas, this is this is the role of, of women. This is the role of females. Uh, they play a very grounded, very realistic role um, that is very self-aware of honor and duty that a man should have. So when you look at some of the dialogues and stuff, if, um, if you've chosen female Eivor, uh, this fits. It fits really well. Um, of course, in other instances, I think there are times where it totally doesn't fit. But you could really make that argument about a lot of different scenarios. Um, you could totally make that argument regarding the social status of different characters. You know, they kind of dance around the idea of thralls and, you know, the idea of uh, upper class versus lower class. And I think they do a lot of this because I, I think they want to avoid um, kind of the, you know, the, the, the dichotomy, I guess I'll say, between characters and how they're treated. I think they really try to focus in on the idea of the, of the Vikings um, 
the way they viewed family, the way they viewed their clan. And I think they hit that nail pretty well, but I think obviously they, they avoid a lot of the class-based stuff. They avoid a lot of the power struggles that to me are, are very relevant for a history class. You know, it's important that, you know, a, a, a student can walk in and say, oh, okay, so this character would be, you know, they, they would live this kind of lifestyle or they would have this kind of standard of living and it would be very different from another. Um, but again, Assassin's Creed has sort of drifted away from that quite a bit, I think, in many of their games. Um, they've been, you know, shy towards social status or sort of left that for something that they've um, focused on for their discovery tours. I found it very fascinating that there is very little evidence of uh, the Vikings' regards towards slavery during the game, like the actual story of uh, Valhalla. I was going to ask about specifically about slavery. Yeah, sure. yeah, because yeah. very, I mean, right at the very start, Eivor is is I think she's either spoken to or she's called a thrall which i think is mm -hmm. the name they would have used for a slave but after that once she's freed herself and reunited with dag and got her axe and her her um, shield i don't think it's ever mentioned again is it but slavery was a big part of what they raided for and what they generated their wealth is my understanding yeah massive part it led to the reputation of uh vikings in many ways too you know when we think about uh why the uh, norse were so feared for you know, so long, why their reputation is uh, that they are the, the heathen army. A lot of that has to do with their views on uh, slavery. Um, but I, I will say this, it, it is possible for, it's rare, but possible for a slave to sort of buy their way out of uh, slavery in, in uh, Norse um, society. But it's also very common for someone to find themselves selling themselves or selling family members into slavery. And um, again, I think the game dances around that idea a little bit. Um, but like, like I'll mention, you know, it, it's, it's not as much in the story, but they, I think they added it as the first discoverable piece in the discovery tour. So the, the latest DLC, uh, yeah, I guess I was very interested with, you know, how they were going to handle some of the more raw, some of the more, um, mature history. And there it is like almost the first thing you discover. They're like, listen, by the way, um, this is a very, uh, serious reality of studying the Vikings. Here are chains from Viking slaves. And I, I thought, okay, hey, you earned a lot of my uh, points here. You, they didn't dance around it when it came to the Discovery Tour. So fine by me. I respect where it's given. <laughs> Credit where it's due. Was there, um, so you, you've played, I presume that, I mean, it's, it's, it's a year nearly since the game was released. So I presume you've completed the main story and all the side content? Yep. Okay, so... I'm going to ask a question. It's going to sound like a spicy question, but it's really not meant to be. Um, was there any point in the game where you kind of, there, there was dialogue or there was a situation or there was a, you know, a, a set level design or something where you just thought, oh, for crying out loud, this is ridiculous. <laughs> this is not at all correct. Or can you sort of turn off the historian brain while you're playing and just enjoy, enjoy the show, should we say? <laughs> Um, okay, I'll, I'll try to answer that. I have a very specific <laughs> answer, which I don't think okay. anyone's happy with. Right. I think it's, it's a fan favorite in the game. But to me, I, I, I struggle with, the, with this aspect of Valhalla and <laughs> it frustrates me. But yes, I'm able to turn the uh, historian brain off and still have some fun with it. The sieges, the castle sieges are uh, <laughs> banana land, as I right. like to say. <laughs> the sieges are nuts. The sieges are um the sieges oh man I, it's hard to even ground it um the sieges are almost total nonsense uh reason being and i think um this is something that has come up pretty in, pretty epic though as, as a as oh a i love it, I love it. Yeah, yeah 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 they're fun they're so fun uh like i said definitely able to turn the brain off those are some of the coolest moments in the game mm. um but it seemed very early on in there uh in the development at least, you know, from talking to uh, some some different people online, it, it seemed as though there was an idea to go with a very accurate approach, but it was boring. Um, they wanted shield walls. They wanted a much more tactical approach <laughs> to uh, some of these locations, towards some of these castles. And I think through trial, okay, I just and take a little, just take a little side sidebar there. I've had a similar conversation many times with people about Odyssey. Why, mm -hmm. why weren't the Odyssey conquest battles more accurate? Because ultimately, standing in a phalanx, just shoving the other guys and trying to overpower them, there's That's no gameplay in right that. On. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, yes, there were battles where thousands of hoplites were killed, but a lot of the time it was a shoving battle and it was who turned the flank first or who had more cavalry that won it. 
and there's no gameplay in that or not really if you want that go and play the total war series you know say, yeah it's, it's a totally different kind of a game and yeah. I, it's, yeah. it's total war it'd be, it'd be a real-time strategy at that point yes that's the only way to really do it properly yes. um so but, but for you the, the sieges in, in valhalla were fun but perhaps not not sprinkled yeah. with accuracy <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll say this because, you know, that, that's probably a bit of a cop out too, though, because obviously I think anyone knowing what to expect from the games probably isn't looking for accurate uh, shield warfare. I, I think mm. they, they know they're getting an action game. So story wise, if there's going to be one um, piece that I would say really doesn't hold up as strong um, when you go to look at the, uh, the history behind it, I would say it's l- much later in the game when you know the uh, alliances have been built we have our our stages set for uh, again the big uh, clash against you know the anglo-saxon leaders you know this is where it's all really seemingly uh, escalating but in reality the real history behind uh, dane law in england is much more conversion based i think that when the societies began to blend over time they became much less violent and that doesn't make for good gameplay either, but it certainly changes the story around a bit where you realize that actually the uh, the great heathen army, or the, I should say the great heathen army 2.0 with the Sons of Ragnar really heating things up, um, that, that would be towards the end of the game where a lot of that fighting would have slowed down quite a bit. And you would have had more sort of political espionage going on, which I think the game kind of hints at a bit early on. But a de-escalation of things is definitely not something where the story wants to go. So I think maybe originally there was an idea to ground the DLCs with an idea that, you know, the the storyline was growing rather than kind of ending on a triumphant battle. But hey, that's... um, That that leads to to be the big discussion there in terms of the, you know, the story's uh, development. I think they really wanted the game to, to end with a really big bang. They wanted... Um, the game to, to escalate when I think in reality a lot of the fighting would have slowed down at around that time period. Um, you know, again, just going through some of those sources there, it's it's interesting to see how um, the Vikings were much more respected over time as they uh, you know really kind of grew in prominence in in England. But the game would doesn't like that because obviously that's again that's uh, that, that's not our hero's tale. It doesn't get easier for the hero. It's got to get more difficult. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Declan, did you want to say something? Um, yes, I had a question. Uh, that's kind of been bugging me a little for you, Mr. Donlan. Okay. Um, I watched your Ragnar, Sons of Ragnar video, which <laughs> yeah, I yeah. Highly, highly recommend anybody watching. Um, it's in the Chilbert arc with Ivar. Now, it's the most uncomfortable scene in Valhalla for me, and I if there's a new game plus, I will skip it. But how likely is it that Avar, Ivar Bonus would have, or any Viking after a conquest, would have performed the Blood Eagle and had someone shoved up on a cliff for everyone to see? And I will admit, I hate saying that because I hate that moment in the game. It's the worst part. It's pretty yeah, horrible. It's it? And it's pretty see. horrible in Vikings when they do it as well, if anyone listening has watched uh, that series on the telly geez it's pretty harrowing yeah they, they don't hold back I, I will not be descriptive don't worry yeah, i know i know my audience <laughs> um <laughs> yeah what i'll say about this uh very very specific um telling in the uh viking sagas is actually r- reports of this also in anglo saxon sources as well so if we're kind of cross-referencing the blood eagle was definitely something that both cultures were well aware of in terms of a, a punishment, in terms of um, something that was uh, horrifying. They were definitely uh, in tune with, with this back then as we are now. So it was a thing. Um, but there's really no direct evidence that the blood eagle was ever actually used. So a lot of historians, I would say most historians, err on the side that this is sort of a, again, you hear the phrase exaggeration a lot, but this is very figurative uh like embellishment to describe in a way what would be like sort of the the metaphorical uh, emotional torture that somebody could give to another person it's very specific as it's labeled in the sagas it's very specific when anglo-saxon sagas reference it 
Um, but there's no direct evidence this is, that this was ever used on anyone. Um, the best we have is a serious threat, but never anything that would have come about to like an actual instance where somebody would do this <laughs> to another person. That's led to a lot of historians going out and really looking for evidence of the Blood Eagle, which is divisive to say the least. Um, but I'd say most historians, um, myself included, they'll see this as um, a product of the sagas, which again, are where you get a lot of the more mythical kind of elements of the, uh, of the, sto of the you know, story elements in um, Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Um, and I, I think it's appropriate that they include it in that realm because a lot of the sagas are written in this very exaggerated, very boasting kind of way. And, hey, what's more of a terrifying threat than the Blood Eagle? And, of course, they're going to, to make a, a reference to it. Um, but, again, there's a lot to be said for the kind of person that knows that this is very Shakespearean writing. This is very figurative language just to describe the emotional torture of a person and uh, it's, it sounds uh, a bit of a stretch to say that this was happening a lot or had ever happened. Um, many historians would like to say that this is, you know, kind of a, uh, a much later addition to, to the sagas to, to give, you know, uh, kids reason to stay up, uh, to not stay up at night, you know, kind of like writing in the boogeyman or something like that. So <laughs> knowing their audience is definitely a reason why they're like, oh, you know, we got to add in a, a bit more gruesome uh, action. Let's, let's add in this, you know, bit of flavor here, and you know that'll really scare everybody. And I think that's probably the the, the real intention behind the Blood Eagle. <laughs> so we we can say I, that uh, poetic license is nothing new. Nope. <laughs> no, we're doing it right now. I, I think uh, in a way, the Assassin's Creed games to me, what I what I tell my students a lot is they're repackaging history for a much more modern audience. Um, there is absolutely nothing new to uh, the way we interpret history, the way we tell history from, uh, from you know, Russell Crowe's Gladiator to Assassin's Creed Valhalla. There's always been a, a modem for how do we tell these stories? How do we, uh, how do we express our, our love for, for this history? And in some ways, we, we do romanticize it. And I think it's uh, doing that is as old as telling stories themselves. So um, job well done by... Uh, by Ubisoft to continue these kind of uh, these stories to keep sort of repackaging them to keep doing it. And I, th I, th I think you're right on there when you're saying it's uh, it's something that they've done before and will probably do again. <laughs> I still can't help feel that Ivar's ending could have been a lot more, how do I word it, impactful if it didn't have that one moment that was kind of over fantasized. I don't, I always feel when I look back at that scene that Ivar's story is really great, his twist at the end was fantastic, but if that had a more of a impactful ending, it didn't lead into a boss battle, I really don't think the boss battle was needed, mm. and I don't really think the Blood Eagle was needed, I feel that's like a creative license decision <laughs> to be a bit too fanatical, you know, let's have a bit of oh, fun. Oh, I see your point. Sagas. This is like something we discussed with Servalan when we were doing the Arno episode, when she was saying, she was talking about some of the novels where, you know, they, they sometimes they pile on the bad stuff a bit too much, where it almost stretches believability. Mm. You know, we know this guy's a bad guy. We don't need you to sort of add more stuff on the screen or more pages in the yep. book, you know, more pain for the protagonist or more death. It's done. You, yeah, you've kind of gone a bit too far now. Let's just do the boss battle and, and move on. Definitely feels like that. Yeah. Um, I, I have to admit, I, 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 Ivar is by far and away one of my favorite characters in the game. And I totally agree. I think they, in a way, botched a lot of the uh, of the ending. I think that I, I'm totally with you on that one. I think the, the boss battle is a, a bit unnecessary. Yeah, I, I think it's it, it's odd. It, I think story wise, I think it it seems like you from you know maybe somebody that's uh, you're just trying to you know you know, play each individual story arc from, uh, from, you know, each of the build alliance sections. I think they, somebody would, would see it and say, okay, well they needed a boss and he kind of works as a villain. So why not? Yeah, um, yeah. but I, I find myself defending him more than, uh, more than not, even though I, I definitely recognize how complicated this, this ending is, but I, I think thematically the way that they are trying to describe, um, how, 
uh, Vikings themselves kind of get lost in their own uh, legend or sort of get lost in their own uh, pursuit of glory are turned and t- turned to almost like a madness degree. Um, and there are plenty of stories of this. In fact, it's a, uh, it's, it's a very popular, um, uh, very popular theme in, in the sagas. I'll, I'll reference uh, Egil's saga, and then one of, one of the more popular ones. Uh, Egil is a villain, very similar to the way that Ivar is, is written. He is uh, a character that many people don't like because he is sort of Machiavellian and his like ends justify the means. Uh, and that's something that in, in Viking culture, they, they really don't uh, respect as highly. You know, obviously you're, you're meant to be the, uh, you know, the, the thrilling, the adventurous, like the, you know, the, the Captain Jack Sparrow kind of, uh, kind of Viking. But at the end of the day, uh, if you go against your, your own values, if you go against your, people who are loyal to you, um, then that's like a, the crime of all crimes um, in a way. And I think Ivar is sort of meant to represent a, an important part of the theme in the game that is expressing the qualities of, uh, in Norse uh, language, what would be called Drenger, which um, I'm going to have to almost swear and say that Drenger most directly translates to uh, the phrase badass uh, in English, which is kind of a fun uh, way of looking at it. But they are characters that have uh, above and beyond courage in the face of death, but also they, they do what they do for, uh, for you know, their clan. They do what they do um, for their name to be remembered. And I, and I think like Egil, uh, Ivar goes too far and the game is trying to show that it's not just blind courage. It's not just uh, blind ambition that gets you to this point, that there's also a, a, a way that it, can, that, that it can turn you into the villain. Now, do I think they handled that theme as good as they could have? No, <laughs> but I think it was in there somewhere where they said, how can we show the player that, you know, the, the values of a Viking, the values of a good Drenger are, are very complicated, that, you know, being a Drenger might be the ultimate goal, but how can it turn against somebody? And I think Ivar is that example of a uh, Viking historical figure where, yeah, the, uh, the, the, the pride goes against him in time, sort of warning players what, what would be the, you know, the ultimate price of a Viking that, uh, that gets obsessed with their, their own pursuit of Valhalla. So I defend it as, as, uh, as begrudgingly as I can. Um, he is my favorite character. I think he's interpreted the best in many ways. Um, but uh, yeah, what a strange ending. Um, and it, not a really good boss fight either, if I might add. <laughs> the boss fight is kind of... It's strange. It's like, why are they fighting on that hillside? It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> because it's dramatic gameplay. Yeah. <laughs> dramatic ending. Yeah. God, don't I've you used the so clip. Funny. Actually, now that we're talking about the sons of uh, Ragnar real quick, I've used the clip many, many a times in many videos. I absolutely love the way, um, I, I, I believe it's, uh, I think it's male Eivor says it a certain way. I don't think female Eivor says it with the same kind of disgust, but there's a part in the cutscenes leading up to it where um, you know, they're fighting, they're going back and forth. And Eivor, I'm sorry, um, Eivor, the main character, is trying to like talk some sense into Ivar. And it's a very like blunt dialogue. It's almost super unhistorically accurate. Like just to, to the 10th degree, it just gets out of, it, it goes way above like any kind of blockbuster Hollywood um, version of it. But at one point, Eivor, it says something like, I'm done with this place. Like I'm done with you and just kind of turns away and looks at him. And I'm thinking that is the most like break the fourth wall of like, let's just get this cutscene moving. (laughs) He says it in a very, like, I'm done with this. If someone was trying to keep up the accent the whole time, he just, he just gave up. (laughs) Brilliant. Um, I just wanted to make a quick point before I passed over to James, if he's got a lot of questions is there's a theme in Valhalla that I noticed quite early on and, I noticed it more with Halfdan, but you mentioned uh, Ivar getting lost in his own legend, you know, his own, well, greed, as I'm going to like call it for a second. Sure, absolutely. But it's exactly what Dag warned Eivor about, you know. If you keep doing what you're going to do, Eivor, you're going to get lost in your own glory, you know. Be warned. And mm. when I played the Halfdan arc, you know, Halfdan was the similar. He got old with war and kind of like lost in his glory to the paranoid and i did mention in the sister server this is like a parable of what dag was warning in avor she was going to become that she's out here seeking alliances she's doing all the battles she's seeking glory one of these days she's going to get lost in it and it kind of shows that 
Ivar got lost in it himself and he maybe went too far. Halfdan got lost in it himself and he's become paranoid. And it seems this big thread in Valhalla that was just kind of like a little thread of how one person's glory for battle, for anything, can lead into trouble. Even if it's just paranoia, going too far to make sure a war doesn't end. Or with Eivor's case, she could have lost her clan if she went too glory hogging. But I really don't think Dag was right because she did kind of <laughs> do everything correctly for a clan. She wasn't doing anything for personal glory. Yeah, I'd say that it's definitely, um, in my opinion, I'd say it's one of the biggest uh, themes in the game. And again, I think uh, his historical um, interpretation-wise of the Icelandic sagas, um, I I gotta say, I, you, I, it's hard not to have a historian smile on your face while playing this game when you you realize just how well versed they are in some of the importance of the sagas. I, I feel as though they, they they read this stuff, you know, they looked at their sources. So how are we going to turn this into the game? And and you know, hopefully, many people, not just one, you know, that that really drank this in said this game is teaching you the values or this, these stories teach you the values of what it means to, uh, to, to be a Northman, you know, to be a, to be a Viking. And I think they really tried to come away with this, this thought of, okay, well, what does it mean to, to be a Viking and how can we have our players kind of live the, the Viking experience? It's, it's one thing to, uh, to, you know, be sitting months before the, the game comes out, looking at um, the different kinds of gameplay mechanics. It's another to see how in their trailer, they uh, really emphasize how this is your saga. I, I remember that being a big takeaway for me with my students kind of saying, no, I, I think instead of focusing on just one or, or two stories, they're going to focus on the sagas as a whole. They're going to look at you know the impact of how the sagas teach about the Vikings and what they have to say about this culture. And I think that uh, idea of glory is handled really well in the game based on you know sort of their, their biggest takeaways from from reading uh, literature on the Vikings. Um, I'll, I'll go back to that uh, phrase I was uh, talking about a minute ago because it's everywhere in the game. You know, they make plenty of references to it in dialogue even, which is just awesome. But they, they reference quite a bit about how, you know, Eivor wants to be considered a dranger among his peers. He wants to, to earn this title. And to him, that's, you know, that, that means like you got a one-way ticket to Valhalla if you can, you know, if you, you have that level of respect with people. Um, but it's what they they do with that phrase and how they challenge the player to think about being a dranger, how they challenge the player to think about glory that I think really hits this home. Uh, I've talked about this in, in uh, one of my, my videos. I think this is an excellent one for, uh, for, for young people, for students, uh, even when they're kind of exploring the, how violent Viking culture was, um, that they never really, in terms of their stories that they wrote down, they, they didn't really have strong malice towards the people that they fought against. You know, it's easy to look back and say, oh, they, they must have hated each other if they were swinging swords at each other, or they must have uh, had a real problem with their neighbor if they wanted to fight their neighbor. But this is uh, really rarely the case in, uh, in the sagas. Oftentimes, conflicts are kind of born of different struggles that uh, they realize that they're, they're both human in the process and that they're kind of just sort of playing their roles. They're defending their values and um, they've come into clash, they've come, come into conflict, not because they dislike each other, but because they have to uphold their, uh, uphold their reputations. Um, and so they have enormous amount of respect for opponents that uh, are as aggressive towards them as they would be towards their opponents. It's kind of this thing of, uh, in a way, it's like sports teams. Like, you know, if you think of, um, like, you know, two teams going up against each other, you don't want to uh, play a soccer match. You don't want to play football against an easy opponent. You want to beat the best in order to be the best. And uh, Vikings have this in them as well. And you know they will always uh, respect their opponents, r regardless of uh, you know how they've come to be their opponent. So there's a you know a side content that makes its way into the game a number of times. We have to fight the the lost drangers of the great heathen army. Um, and the way they handle the dialogue is just perfect. It, it really hits it so well how. You know, Eivor doesn't want to, to fight these characters. There's no ill will. There's no malice. There's no, oh, you, you did this terrible thing to my family. I'm going to do this terrible thing to you. Instead, they, they recognize that they want to go out on top, that they want to, uh, to fight the best, to be defeated by the best. And, and there's, uh, there's, there's good in doing that. There's, uh, 
there's a respect in someone who defeats me carrying on my name. Uh, and this is something that is uh, loaded into the, the Icelandic sagas. It's a huge part of, in my opinion, I think why the, the sagas remain uh, something so uh, important for Viking culture is because of this way that they handle uh, their legacies and being remembered. So again, I think the game does a great job of taking the core message of the sagas about glory and Valhalla and about Drangers and saying, okay, how can we really weave this into our narrative just so much that it's, it, it feels like all the characters are very grounded, that at the end of the day, their, their pursuits for, uh, for their legacies are, are, are authentic, are, are the kind of things that this is how a Viking would think. This is the kind of things that they would value. Or, and yes, this is the kind of arguments they would make. And, and I think they, 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 they really nailed that, in my opinion, in so many ways. Uh, to some extent, they did a, a bit too much, maybe with Ivar. <laughs> um, but it's, it's, it's excellent that at the core of uh, how they were telling their story, I think they really took multiple uh, steps back and said, OK, but let's think like a Viking real quick. Let's think like how they would want this story to be told. Um, and again, re really cool that uh, there's plenty of moments where you can uh, hold up to different uh, sagas, for example, and say, yeah, this is it. This is, this is totally what they would, what, what they would do. <laughs> I'll say you're giving me a newfound respect for the game, I must say. <laughs> um, I did enjoy the game, but there was a number of times where I, I was just feeling uh, frustrated just with the amount of stuff to do. Um, and what I'm thinking now is I probably approached it with the wrong mindset. Maybe I should have just chilled out and listened to the dialogue more closely and listened to the stories more closely. Um, it, it's funny because I guess for some people who played the game who maybe knew the real history or knew sagas or just knew the mythology, there's a lot of clues in there as to where the story is going and who is who and what's going to happen. <laughs> oh, definitely. Um, but for me, I had never learned any of, despite being British, as people listening might tell from my accent, um, we weren't taught in school any of the histories of of England or Scotland or Wales or Ireland. Um, you know, there, was, there, was, there were Romans, and then you kind of skip forward to 1066 and William the Conqueror and everything that happens in between, which is just as fascinating with the heptarchy and, and the different sort of um, uh, tribes gradually migrating, all of that is skipped over. Mm. Um, so I kind of just played the game very straight through the game without really, I guess, probably missing an awful lot of depth and detail that you're describing there. So yeah, you're, you're giving me a, a newfound respect <laughs> for, for what the work that was put in to create the characters and these little story arcs and and, and and like you say, with the Drengir, which you'll see maybe once every 20 hours, but what you're saying is there's there's depth and there's consistency across all of those um, small stories, um, which I, I, I respect. Yeah, I, again, I, I'll emphasize, I wish there was more. <laughs> you know, I think uh, at the end of the day, they're, they're, these are action adventure games. You know, they're, um, they're heavily marketing these towards a, uh, you know, they're, do, do they always have uh, thinking like a Viking in mind? No. Um, and I think level design wise, if we want to kind of break from the story and go into, uh, you know, the, the world that they've designed, there's many times there, there's, we could go on and on all day um, about the, the level of inaccuracies with the churches and the buildings and things like that. Um, but I, I think what they're trying to go for is sort of a, like an overall um, mood of, that sounds like such a strange way to put it, but um, when the Icelandic sagas are written as fantasy, it is very like fairy tale like that they're trying to to express with the different uh, places that you visit uh, in the game. And, and I think if there were times where um, I sort of battled with, is this accurate? It's definitely not. It's bothering me. Battled with those emotions and said, well, I get what they're trying to do. I think more often than not, I was very aware that, okay, they're, they're they're weaving this in with fantasy, as is as is on par with the sagas, um, and I think that it's easy to miss a lot of the history because of how much fantasy there really is in the game. I think the costumes, as pe many people have pointed out, really take away from a lot of the immersion sometimes. <laughs> and when there's two characters yeah. that have a bit of dialogue, that the dialogue might be great. That the you know the the uh, what they're saying might be very grounded, maybe not necessarily their accents, but you know what what they're saying might really have some some good interesting weight, uh, very in line with what you'd see with some really good blockbuster 
movies that um, really try to put out an authentic script. Um, if you know the one character is wearing something completely ridiculous and the other has like lava pouring out of their shield, you're gonna you're gonna be detached. <laughs> I, I totally there are some totally nuts um, gear sets and and outfits available, aren't there? Yeah. <laughs> But I see your point uh, that that perhaps totally. detracts from what what you should be paying attention to, which mm-hmm. is the characters and what they're thinking and what they're saying. Mm-hmm. Definitely. <laughs> and I think the decisions too. some people can be very uh, put off by the idea that in a historical game, they could have uh, the storylines go. I know these are small arcs, but the storylines can go in different directions. I think that was one thing that I you know, I, I talked about with some some of my colleagues uh, and, and some other historians that are much more knowledgeable than me. I had a really hard time with it. Like, well, what do you mean you can change history within the game? Um, and but from an educator, I actually found this to be, uh, in my opinion, one of the better aspects to how history was handled in the game. Uh, reason being, I think what you're teaching the students is a bit more of cause and effect. And I think what it does is. It's, you know, it's a historical what if, if you made this decision versus that, but what it does is it makes gamers, it makes players pause and really think about the consequences of their actions, thinking that a story isn't just going to take me through this, that I have to become an active uh, player in understanding this history and knowing what's going to happen. And I think the fun is going back and sort of realizing, hey, if this didn't happen the way it did, this is what would have happened. Um, I love engaging in questions like that with my students where they're thinking about the different decisions that historical figures make and, you know, how they're uh, perceiving what the future could look like, how they're very cautious and, you know, why they do what they do is oftentimes because they sit in on these very moments that the game sits in on. It says, you know, here's a decision that could lead to this. Here's a decision that could lead to that. And to me, it feels very authentic um, for the way that the story kind of slows down and says, hey, this is a pivotal moment in uh, Viking history. You know, make sure you make the right choice or be prepared to live with the wrong choice. Uh, I really like how, uh, how the game does that. I know a lot of people don't. They say, oh, they should have just stuck with one timeline. But I, I think you miss a lot of, you know, like, you know, a lot of what's so interesting about history. A lot of what's, uh, when, when you pause and ask a really good question, is this person a good leader? Or did this person make the right decision? I think some of, some of that's some of the best ways to engage with history. So... I'm a fan of that. I know I know not many people are, <laughs> but I think personally that's where Assassin's Creed since day one got history right. Mm. Instead of playing a game where you time travel into the past and you were locked to the past, you have an animus that creates a simulation of a memory. You can make those pivotal choice moments be reality because you're just doing another simulation based off data. If this person had tons of written down thoughts of a battle and what he would have done different, and you revisit it for the animus, you could build a simulation based off what he thought he could have done different. So you could have witnessed battles that were lost in history, but how they could have won if a general order his troops do something different. You're not changing history because it's an animus, it's just a simulation. But you as a player or as an historian, can see those pivotal moments of history, you know, how even small effects could have pushed in. And in Valhalla, you know, with a little bit of the choices, you know, they're just the minute things ever, but, you know, one word could start a war, for example. I know it doesn't in Valhalla, but, Mm -hmm. you know, and having the animus giving the player that agency to not change history because it's simulation, but change the simulation and see how you know, a Viking may respond to a different situation or how Avar's choices may get a different outcome from the character. It kind of shows how a real-life Viking conversation would go. You know, there's that cause to effect Mm -hmm. without changing what's grounded and written. And I think that's kind of a perfect take for the series, in my opinion. Oh, absolutely. Um, I'll I'll admit, um, as far as uh, teaching goes, as far as lesson planning goes, um, I have tried to develop uh, my own video game uh, on that exact principle. Um, I think uh, I've uh, spent a couple of years now, I think I'm on my my fourth year uh, developing a project that uh, works like a video game in which um, I have my students do exactly that. They, uh, They make different historical decisions and the fun um, in letting kids play the game 
is instead of watching the history really change because the events happen, um, the major thing that they are making a decision on is the perception of the event, the, the way in which they do it. You know, I, I always kind of give the example of, um, you know, it's uh, in terms of history, it, it's told by the winners, of course, but sometimes you're sitting on that winning side and you view that winner very favorably. And sometimes you're sitting on the loser side and you don't view that winner very favorably. And so it's fun to sort of uh, see some of my students uh, play this game and, you know, they're, they're playing through the role of the hero and the villain. And what they don't realize is with a story like Valhalla, it's the same story. You're just reading different perspectives towards some, like in Dane Law at the time, this was a triumphant experience towards the uh, other end of the spectrum. The Anglo-Saxons would have viewed them as villains. And I think uh, Valhalla does this really well. I think it would be interesting to, to see how a decision gets made and then go back to uh, kind of see the setting and how the setting kind of changes based on your interactions. There's a number of games that have done this really well, like the Witcher series is, is obviously a standout in the way they world build with their storytelling. But um, I agree, I, I, I think Valhalla has so much potential uh, and it does so many things right the way it shows your character progression over time and how to some you're the hero and to others you're the villain um, and you know you're making these choices but you really do choose to see how it impacts you you choose to see how it impacts the clan you choose to see the battlefield after and i think you could be left with different uh perspectives different in interpretations and i think that's kind of the, the joy of reading history saying wow this really does go down totally different roads you know one minute i'm uh, I'm, I'm the hero, and then the, the next minute I have the last name, the Ruthless, you know, <laughs> um, which is interesting. So, James, have you got any more points before we wrap up? I have got so many questions. <laughs> I'm ready to whatever. <laughs> I want to talk about AC3 because we were mentioning that briefly before we hit the record button. I want to talk more about Unity and Syndicate. So yeah, I reckon maybe another six hours and, and then we're done. <laughs> uh, we you should probably we should probably wrap it up though, shouldn't we? Because we here we were here specifically to talk about Valhalla, but maybe we could you know meet up again soon and and do, take another time period and uh, another dive. Uh, dive into the history or the history versus the fiction um I, I'll, I'll just say one very quick point so i think the reason that declan um got in contact with you was your um what was the name of the video remind me because <laughs> oh, oh, the sons uh, of ragnar that was yeah. it that was it which was uh, very very entertaining uh, them as a biker gang it's just hilarious mm -hmm. um but i will say that anyone that uses uh, excerpts from monty python and horrible histories to illustrate <laughs> their points happy days because horrible histories is an absolute gem of a television oh, yeah. program <laughs> i grew uh, up on that too <laughs> you did excellent mm -hmm. excellent uh yeah so no I, it's been a really interesting conversation i mean um I'll, i will ask one final question so we started the show with with you mr donlan um talking about syndicate and that's where you tried to sort of start introducing your um pupils to kind of a a recreation of a historical world mm. one thing that always stuck in my mind was syndicate and i've never asked this question anywhere and hey as you're here i'm going to ask the question <laughs> there are ice cream sellers oh no in syndicate and this is 1868 now i i don't know did they have the ability to create frozen desserts in 1868 i don't know i've always wondered if that's true or not what do you think no no not really um there would be a kind of like a frozen yogurt uh that would work um but uh, even that stretching it quite a bit. It would definitely not be accessible. It would not be something that uh, would be you, you, you'd you'd see as frequent as it is in uh, in uh, in syndicate. I will say this though: the idea of the ice cream cone um, becomes very impactful uh, in a short amount of history later. Um, the, uh, the the famous uh, mythical tale, if you will, of um, a uh, a waffle cone stand. Um, and an ice cream stand merging together after one <laughs> of them didn't have enough buyers and the other one ran out of bowls um, is sort of where you get this beautiful union uh, with uh, with something so trivial but yet so delicious. Um, it's it's a bit such a perfect story, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's a bit out of the time zone. But you know what? Honestly, I, I, I think it fits enough in a way that I think they were trying to show you a lot of the, again, I, I'm a big into the themes. But I think what they were trying to show you is that you're looking at a world that is really not that different 
uh, with syndicate um, within these cities. You know, the, it has a, a lifeblood, if you will. It has you know a, a beating pulse that has so many you know kind of smaller examples of culture that you know we might see as something that isn't you know as prominent, but it totally is. You know, like like something like ice cream, uh, and it it fits in the way that it gives the city so much life. So I'd say keep it, even though it doesn't necessarily fit. We're not talking too far off the timeline. It's only about maybe uh, a decade or two, but... <laughs> That's close enough. Yeah, close mm-hmm. enough. Close enough. In, in terms of Assassin's Creed timeline, it is not the farthest uh, thing that they've gone for, or mm. not, the, not the most outside of the timeline thing that they've mm. gone for. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've got one final question, Declan, because De- Declan does all of our audio editing. So the longer we talk, um, the harder his job is. But I've got one final question for, for our guest. I'll try um, to be brief. <laughs> <laughs> so um, Assassin's Creed has, has sort of traveled around the world, um, mostly, however, European centric and, and several different games set in North America. Where would you like to go just as a pure historical nerd point of view? what country or what what region and what time period would you like to explore through the animus wow um i have gone so back and forth on this many many times you can give more than one answer it's okay we're not going to hold you to it (laughs) i I have I've, i've gone so back and forth on this um but i will definitely hone in on i i know um my uh my 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 history my background is uh is in culture in world religions and I, for years, have said I think there is uh, a lot of potential in uh, exploring India and, uh, it, you know, the roots of ancient India or, you know, maybe it's, uh, maybe it's the Gupta. Um, I think there is so much to offer. There's so much that I think, uh, you know, younger players, people that might not be very familiar with uh, India's roots would really, really enjoy uh, these stories or, you know, learning about this culture. I think that could be there's so much potential there really is a lot of potential if that's the case um but online i've been engaging in uh different discussions where there are many that think that what is coming down the pike is a uh assassin's creed world war one or world war two um and as baffling as it sounds from you know a, a changing up the formula perspective i know there's a lot of people that really don't like that uh i think that they're is some very interesting uh, possibilities with doing the scope of uh, World War I Europe or World War II uh, Europe, or even something uh, different from just those uh, two settings, but you know, talking about uh, focusing, or I should say focusing on uh, a world at war. Um, Assassin's Creed has been very comfortable uh, going over you know, different civilizations or high points or uh, you know, controversial points like um, like, uh, you know, say uh, the American Revolution or uh, the French Revolution, they've, you know, they've kind of sat in on conflicts before, but I don't think they've really uh, engaged um, with a, a world conflict uh, quite as interestingly as they could something like World War I or World War II. Uh, the, the way I, I, I think gives them so much potential is just how many different perspectives they had in Valhalla. And I think it could be very interesting to sort of explore the animus in uh, in different realms and different uh, roles during World War One or World War Two, you know, just being a a person from from different countries or having to explore different countries at that time. Um, I think part of me is also waiting for a game that does that better than just a, a World War Two or World War One shooter. <laughs> um, there's so many battlefields out there. There's a lot of Call of Duties out there that I think don't really focus as much on the history as much as they do the uh, first person shooter gameplay and. I'm kind of eagerly awaiting an opportunity to uh, explore a setting more than just kind of running through a battlefield. Um, so yeah. I, I would have to lean towards World War One or World War Two. If I had to say, if there would be one that would uh, entice me the most, it would be that. And I think it would be just different enough that um, you'd have people saying, well, the Assassin's Creed formula has changed before. It's uh, here it is. It's changing again. Um, and again, I, I think there's possibilities there. I, I wouldn't like a total change of the formula. I still uh, have a very, uh, very um, uh, strong place in my heart for a game like Unity. Um, but I think if they're able to sort of show that they can handle different time periods, uh, even uh, one, you know, even a time period that's been handled in the video game industry very different, uh, like a first person shooter now switched up into an open world game, I, I think there's. Uh, 
I think there's a lot of reasons to uh, to get excited for something like that. So I don't know. Was that the worst answer you've ever heard? <laughs> no, to be honest, it was not one. I, I know there's been, I mean, you, you see frequently on, on, for example, the Assassin's Creed subreddit, someone will, will throw in a, a pitch or a, a sketch for how a, a World War One or World War Two game might mm -hmm. pan out. I'll be honest, for me, I feel like, if you're being a sneaky assassin with a hidden blade, how do you mix that with machine guns and TNT and tanks? Yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> now, of course, I'm being a little bit flippant there. You don't have to do it on the front lines or in the trenches. You can you can have a spy thriller in Berlin, Paris, and London, for example. Well, that's what um, I was thinking. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, hey, even Lydia, in Cold War, I was busy in World War One. She could have more more action in World War Two, maybe. Um, you know, you've got enough enough going on in terms of espionage in both um, conflicts. That that would be, I guess, where you'd insert the hidden blade and the, you know, working in the shadows kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, no, not the worst answer I've heard at all. Like it would just be interesting right. to know <laughs> yeah, how how do you mix it with, as I say, that kind of high tech weaponry? Um, or do you just ignore it and carve your own story? Because, hey, there's clever writers out there, much cleverer than me, that's for sure. What do you right. think, Declan? Where would you go next if you could pick a spot on the globe and a, a point in time? Um, just quick on uh, point of World War One or Two. I think I would like to add that the way Syndicate built the world will be perfect for World War One or World War Two. You know, concealed weaponry, like a sword cane, so mm -hmm. it wasn't noticeable because I do think... In history, somebody was assassinated by an umbrella that was tipped with poison. So, there is a lot of ways the game could work with, like, an open-world city, use a lot more spy-tech gadgets for hiding weaponry, and more stealth-oriented. So, I could see it working as a phenomenal game, to be honest. But, personally, I want to go to Mayan or Aztec. Especially oh, yeah. since the Mayans did worship the sun god, and they were the first ones to prophesize the 2012 apocalypse. So maybe an Isu connection to how they found out about the first solar flare. Well, second solar flare. And oh, that's perfect for kind Ooh, of interesting. I changed my vote. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's too late now. You're on record. You're on record. I was gonna say, <laughs> who's this guy talking about World War One, World War Two? We all know the right answer. <laughs> can we can we edit that a bit out? No, we don't edit on this show. So sorry, yeah. sorry, that's yeah. it. Now. <laughs> I gotta be honest. Again, that, that so much of it is me coming at this from a, a historical lens. I, I remind my students of these kind of things a lot. They, they'll say something to me. How does that work gameplay wise? And I, again, I'll be honest, most of my time spent playing the game is uh, I am an observer of the action. Um, I love to look in the background. I love to, to see what's happening. I'm, I, I struggle when it comes to playing it. The, the, the Hidden Blade wasn't even on my mind when I went to, to answer that, I have to be honest. When I, when I play these games, I'm so immersed in the cities that at the end of the day, I, 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 I read about the, uh, the Templars versus the Assassins, and so much of it is so lost on me. That I go, oh, well, that's cool, it's great, but look at this cathedral. Oh, it's amazing. So <laughs> I have to admit, it would, it would look really cool from a historical point, but you're absolutely right. I have no idea how that would make it work for the assassins part of the game, the core of the game. <laughs> I think as I always argue, and I get a lot of trouble, as long as it keeps the theme and narrative of freedom versus order and dash of Isu, you don't need the hidden blade. That's probably going to get me in a lot of trouble. Ooh, that's, I, that's unstable ground, my friend. <laughs> how, do I, how do I edit? <laughs> I, I just kind of, you know, I'm on this fence of Assassin's Creed is 14 years old. We've had over 14 years of Hidden Blades. Can we not have a bit of a story, a bit of a difference? You know, have a little bit of a flair. Odyssey's kind of was what i was after and i did enjoy it for that so i'm probably gonna get pitchforks after me so uh yeah <laughs> <laughs> quick wrap up the show before i get in trouble yes, wrap it up now stop digging yourself into a bigger hole <laughs> i'm staying silent on this one i will be <laughs> oh i'll so, tell you what declan i don't mind we'll just go all in i love odyssey it's awesome let's carry on odyssey is fantastic but I, um so great history it, too it is and i think that is actually the next fact of fiction i want to visit is honestly <gasps> happy days let's do it the game yeah. 
is I'm massive. <laughs> the game is fantastic, and one of its mission points is actually a pivotal moment in human sport, and I think we cool talk about history, and that's the Olympics. Definitely. It was invented in Greece, and it's now become one of the biggest staples of human sport, so I don't see fact and fiction is on the cards, I hope. I think so. So I think this is all we have time for tonight. Um, I hope you've all enjoyed it and learned as much as I actually have learned. I've not done a lot of homework. I think I have to go back and maybe sit in one of Mr. Donlan's classes if he's talking about Vikings. <laughs> Definitely. Definitely. Come, we'll, get, we'll get on a I'll flight. Join my, yep. <laughs> I'll join my uh, Microsoft Windows Teams. <laughs> Yeah, make sure you bring your Xbox. Yeah. <laughs> I've got a series. I'll, We're I'll gonna make sure that you one hundred percent of the game before you we uh, before we grade you. <laughs> I haven't yet. No, and but there's yeah. very few that have hundred percent. <laughs> so, um, thank you everyone for joining. If you have any questions or any comments, please tweet us at Assassin's Creed Let's Talk and at James Tillyquid. If you want to make any comments or you'd like to join the show, you can also email as well at Assassin's Creed Let's Talk at gmail.com. Um, yeah, so hopefully this is on next week and thank you so for joining. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Thanks for coming and joining us, Mr. Donovan. It's been great. Awesome. Thanks. It's been a lot of fun. <laughs>